Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the Bishkek Arbitration Days. This panel is dedicated to the impact of COVID-19 on contracts. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Shirin Gurdova. I'm an arbitration practitioner based in Paris, and it's my utmost pleasure to, uh, to moderate this panel today. So, um, what is the impact of COVID-19 on contractual obligations? What is its impact on day-to-day -day operations of legal departments? Can anti-pandemic measures taken by governments be considered a force majeure and why? All these questions will be answered by our speakers today. I would like to introduce them now. Our first speaker is Dr. Dmitry Davidenko. He's an associate professor at the Moscow Institute, State Institute of International Relations. He's an executive secretary of the Expert Council under the ICC Russia Commission on Arbitration. He's also the director of the CIS Arbitration Forum. He has been practicing law for more than 15 years, and he has been involved in many Russian and cross-border disputes. He's an author of over 80 research papers and two books. He has been listed among the best arbitration practitioners in Russia for three consecutive years between 2017 and 2019 by Who's Who Legal and Global Arbitration Review. Our second speaker is Ella Omilchenko. Ella is a counsel at Clifford Chance, Clifford Chance's office in Moscow. She specializes in all aspects of corporate transactions, including real estate, oil and gas, energy, and infrastructure. She also advises on real estate development with a special focus on construction. She has extensive experience in all aspects of foreign investment in real estate. Our next speaker is Alexander Ahmedbekov. Alexander is a corporate counsel in ultra high net worth individual family office. He has almost 20 years of experience in Russian and international law firms, as well as investment funds. And finally, let me introduce Thomas Vail. Thomas is the founder of Vail Dispute Resolution. He's an, he's an arbitrator and arbitration practitioner based in London. He has over 10 years of arbitration experience. He's native of both English and Russian. He is recognized as a leading arbitration practitioner by Who's Who Legal and Legal 500 UK. Thomas has represented clients throughout the world, most frequently in Russia and the Commonwealth of Independent States, Eastern Europe and Africa. He has particular experience of the petroleum and mining industries. And I also would like to thank the organizers, um, Putilin Sipal and the American University of Central Asia for organizing this wonderful event. Now, without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Dmitry Davidenko. He will review the case law on force majeure and hardship in international commercial contracts. Dmitry, the floor is yours. Uh, my task today uh, is to make a brief overview of the existing uh, case uh, law on such important uh, legal doctrines as force majeure and hardship. Uh, now I will uh, share with you my presentation, which was prepared especially for this purpose. So, uh, as a general remark, clearly this pandemic results in a large-scale economic turbulence which uh, has the following consequence. One of the consequences is that debtors in international contracts uh, will likely uh, frequently rely uh, or uh, invoke the impossibility to perform the contract uh, to, well, say that uh, the performance of the contract becomes unexpectedly burdensome because of the restrictions imposed on trade and movement of uh, persons and goods, uh, economic crisis, price fluctuations and uh, similar events may also become a frequent argument in disputes caused by pandemic. Therefore, uh, such concepts as force majeure and hardship, which we usually uh, consider exceptional remedies, might uh, 
mm, become regular in uh, various situations. Uh, first of all, this is important to uh, keep in mind while uh, resolving such disputes and while planning the strategy such disputes. The purposes of the legal regulation, including the economic approach to law, law and economics. So one of the uh, purposes of the regulations is to ensure a balance between stability and flexibility of contractual relations. Another is uh, that the risks uh, which derive from the pandemic should be equally allocated between the businesses, it is between the parties to international commercial contracts. Another purpose is, is that legal stability should be preserved anyway, rather than uh, the chaos caused by uh, the pandemic uh, aggravated. And uh, the economy should be restored from the crisis. Keeping in mind these purposes, I now uh, proceed to uh, past examples of uh, dispute resolution, uh, especially from uh, the practice of arbitration, International Chamber of Commerce, and uh, some others. Uh, the uh, study of case law on uh, force majeure and hardship shows that it is uh, very important to clearly and well formulate the contractual contract clause because uh, when such clause exists in the contract the arbitrators and judges first of all apply it and only then the applicable law the applicable law differs in many states and uh, however uh, in general it is um, close to the concepts which are specified in the Vienna Convention, Convention of 1980 in Article 79 about the impediment beyond the party's control, the sale of sale of goods convention, and uh, on the UNIDRA principles on international commercial courts and contracts, uh, force majeure and hardship. Also, the courts uh, formulate the, the same principles in many legal systems. The case law shows that as a rule, data can be released from liability in the city in the cases where the impediment uh, was not foreseeable at all uh, at the time of the conclusion of the contract and its consequences on the impediment itself could not be avoided or overcome it is the, the debtor himself who should prove that he didn't assume this risk uh, interestingly there are cases which show that the data may prove that uh, he was unable to predict the extent and period of existence of the impediment, which is relevant to the pandemic due to its unprecedented extent. Uh, as regards the uh, well references of the parties that the contract might become more burdensome, the general rule is that uh, even if this risk was not foreseeable, uh, the parties do bear it uh, anyway. So the buyer bears the risk that the price of goods drops down, for example, the seller uh, on the contrary bears the risk that the price will increase. And if uh, there is lack of money, for example, uh, the party uh, uh, cannot anymore obtain the loan or the loan was terminated uh, this as a rule does not uh, relieve the party from its contractual obligation however the parties may agree otherwise in their uh, contract uh, exceptionally it is possible to rely on uh, economic uh, changes when for example an extraordinary depreciation of money occurred or that the performance has become economically impracticable because the expenses of the party uh, increased in an extraordinary way. Or, for example, there is a state act which directly prohibits uh, the importation exportation of goods or payment in a foreign currency and other way of payment is impossible. 
So uh, according to the principle of good faith, uh, this is a reason for uh, relief from liability of a party. However, the general rule, as the case law shows, is that an economic downturn uh, does not amount to force majeure. Uh, it is an, uh, considered to be an ordinary contractual risk. For example, in one case, uh, the result uh, during the, an ICC arbitration proceedings, uh, the, part, the buyer referred to economic downturn uh, that uh, the contract force majeure clause was uh, open. Uh, it s provided some examples of force majeure events and added that any other reason beyond reasonable control of the party is also a force majeure. However, the arbitral tribunal uh, found that other examples of force majeure, uh, such as, for example, a war um, or natural disaster, uh, had nothing to do with an economic downturn. So um, the tribunal confirmed that only if the risk related to economic uh, uh, events uh, are expressly specified in the contract, only then the party may refer to them. Uh, uh, the most, uh, or perhaps one of the most important cases uh, for, uh, well, uh, the subject which we consider now is uh, uh, case uh, Global Tungsten Powder Corporation versus, La versus Lago Resources. In that case, the supplier referred to the drought, which prevented him from making uh, the tungsten concentrate because it was not possible to anymore uh, to obtain the water. However, the buyer objected that it was possible for the supplier uh, to obtain water because uh, it was possible to carry it uh, in trucks uh, so many kilometers though. It would, uh, of course, increase the cost of producing the goods tremendously, but the buyer uh, said that it was the risk of the supplier. The Abidal Tribunal recognized indeed the drought as force majeure because uh, it agreed that the performance of the contract became impossible or economically impracticable. However, uh, the tribunal uh, confirmed that for the, as regards the initial period of the contract performance, then uh, the consequences of the drought could have been avoided by the seller if he had installed a more efficient water supply system because the contract provided that the uh, seller should uh, uh, attach commercially reasonable maximum efforts to overcome the problem. And so the tribunal decided that he did not. Therefore, the tribunal ordered the supplier to pay losses for non delivery of the goods for the initial period of the drought. Many interesting conclusions were made within this case. Some of them are just confirming uh, the general approach. For example, that if a party refers to a force majeure event, then the party bears the burden of proof, proof that this event caused the impossibility of performance. Then another interesting conclusion is that if uh, a party must uh, produce and sell generic goods, then it must uh, find uh, a reasonable replacement for such goods, for example, which have uh, similar or the same properties uh, in the market, which means in the global market. Therefore, it is important for the sellers to specify directly in their contract that uh, they will provide the goods only from specific sources rather than from the whole market. Um, however, the arbitral tribunal agreed that it is uh, unreasonable to expect that the party will uh, use some unrealistic, impracticable and uneconomical extremes to obtain goods so that uh, the 
expenses would be much higher uh, than the for example the price of the contract uh, well uh, another interesting conclusion is uh, that for example if there was an unforeseen natural disaster uh, and the goods were lost for example and perished but it was because the packaging was defective then the forced majority disaster does not relieve the seller from its uh, liability another interesting conclusion uh, concerns the necessity of the notice of force majeure uh, as you know in many legal systems and uh, international documents uh, it is necessary for the party to duly uh, and uh, quickly notify the other party of force majeure. However, uh, in the uh, international arbitration case uh, law, uh, it was confirmed that uh, there is no right to invoke work force majeure if uh, the party did not make a timely notice, only if the contract provides so. or only uh, the other party shows that it suffered some damage uh, due to such failure to notify and of course if the other party knew was well aware of this disaster of uh, this uh, event then the notice is uh, not important as a general rule uh, another aspect of the problem is uh, when the force majeure event is uh, over and uh, it was already decided in some cases uh, if uh, the fulfillment of obligations in complete is now completely possible and unlimited only then uh, the force majeure event is considered to be finished over and done with uh, however uh, if uh, the event uh, is over uh, the period for fulfillment of obligations may be extended for some more days because it's maybe necessary for the party to restore its business operations. So it's not on this the next day after the well um, the restrictions are uh, non-existent. Not this the next day may be necessarily the time to perform the contract, but the party may enjoy some additional period uh, it is important uh, to uh, pay attention to uh, force majeure clause uh, and uh, as uh, some of you already know ICC uh, work, worked out uh, a new version of uh, model force majeure and model hardship clauses uh, in March uh, of this year. Now there are two uh, different forms of force majeure clauses, long form and short form, uh, which the parties may use. It is interesting that, uh, uh, well, uh, the force majeure event is defined in the way that um, it's not uh, the same as impossibility to perform the contract. It's an occurrence of an event that prevents or impedes a party from performing its contractual obligations. So uh, it's not necessarily uh, impossible, completely impossible, but uh, there is an impediment. Uh, and of course, uh, um, uh, if the consequences of the event cannot be avoided or overcome. There is also a list of force majeure events which the parties may uh, add uh, or may amend uh, according to their particular wishes. And there is also an ICC new ICC hardship clause. Uh, as you know, hardship means that it is still possible to perform the contract, but it, uh, now it is mo much more burdensome. So uh, the affected party may uh, uh, demand from the other party to renegotiate the contract to adapt it to the new circumstances. If the other parties, if the parties fail to agree, then they may apply to court or uh, well, arbitration uh, to, in some legal systems, to terminate, only to terminate the contract in some legal systems, to terminate or uh, amend 
um, adapt the contract. So there are two options in the clause, adaptation or termination, whichever is more preferable for the parties. Uh, so uh, to, uh, finally, I would summarize that in general, the parties are uh, in the existing case law, they are normally not relieved from their obligations. That uh, rather high uh, burden is on the party who involves forced measure and hardship. Uh, and uh, references to economic crisis uh, are usually not enough as a rule to uh, relieve the party from its liability. However much depends on the particular contractual clause. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, you will find more in additional uh, reading. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dmitry, for this <clears throat> enlightening presentation. It was very interesting. And now uh, Ella Omachenko will present on impact of the COVID-19 on contracts, on construction contracts. Ella, the floor is yours. So thank um, all the organizers to provide such a great opportunity for all of us, uh, professionals, advisors, um, participants of different industries and markets, uh, to share our views, to um, share our experience um, in, in such a turbulent times. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the impact of, of COVID-19 on the construction contracts. And um, I will share the screen right now to uh, demonstrate the presentation. So let me start. Mm, so the COVID-19 outbreak was declared a pandemic by uh, WHO on 11th March 2020. And since then, national governments of countries, um, of all, almost all countries, have started implementing measures uh, and restrictions um, aiming to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, these measures um, including um, included uh, um, bans and restrictions, uh, both dealing with movement of people, goods um, across countries and uh, even within one country locally. Inevitably, uh, many parties are finding it increasingly uh, difficult to, uh, and sometimes even impossible to perform contracts which were signed uh, before uh, that outbreak. So where are we now? Uh, we, what we see currently is that national government kicked in emergency plans and measures um, as their immediate reaction uh, and response to COVID-19 out, outbreak. State of emergencies and city lockdowns have been announced and implemented um, almost everywhere. Um, Innovative measures such as um, quasi-quarantine regimes um, and so-called self-isolation uh, regime have been uh, implemented. Uh, for instance, um, uh, Russian government permitted local governments to adopt and implement their own self-isolation guidance uh, and uh, regimes locally, depending um, uh, by region. Major events have been postponed, such as Olympic Games, for instance. Production units, factories, offices, schools, restaurants, shopping malls have been closed. Um, now we see that some countries uh, have started easing lockdown restrictions and um, some restrictions are being relieved uh, in respect of some industries or um, economic sectors. And currently we see that business is um, going to um, be back to normal. Um, in face of uh, vaccine trials uh, battling the virus. However, uh, it is still too early to predict uh, when we come to that stage. 
Uh, since COVID-19 has largely destabilized uh, global economy, all industries and sectors um, uh, are impacted. And construction industry, of course, is no exception to that case. Um, we see that both companies, owners, clients, and contractors experience difficulties, um, which are mainly common. And um, all, all these problems uh, that companies and construction companies are facing now, they're quite urgent and uh, require quite effective solutions in the new, new reality. Uh, definitely the construction landscape is changing and this new normal will likely stay with us even after the outbreaks uh, recedes. Contractors and companies are seeking legal assistance Distance and support to navigate through the new challenges that they are facing in this uh, new reality. And I'm, I was going to show you some examples of recent queries, questions that we have been asked to advise on so far from many of our clients. Public health uh, is a primary concern and uh, major restrictions have been in the area of health and safety of employees. Uh, new policies, um, which should be now in place uh, and adopted in various companies, they mostly concern uh, regulations of shifts, um, requirements of um, temperature checks, disinfection of sites, tools and equipment. All scope of uh, employment relation issues and um, also requirements to comply or obtain some types of permits uh, have changed uh, due to travel ban, shutdown of airports, uh, ports, um, and other transportation. These all, uh, these all factors actually impacted movement and relocation of workforce and definitely impacted many construction projects. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that those who arrive from certain countries should have waited up to a um, certain period of time, um, up to two weeks, um, mainly uh, before returning to work. And these quarantine measures definitely impacted um, availability of workforce in many construction projects. Uh, Second issues, uh, second issue uh, connected to the uh, healthcare and safety issues, the key personnel. We all know that uh, key personnel is now uh, unavailable in some projects uh, and contractors are unable basically to comply with uh, their obligation to keep key personnel, retain it uh, uh, at the site. Um, another issue uh, which is a, uh, of a great concern um, is uh, whether or not the event which uh, everyone's currently facing can be treated as a force majeure or material adverse effect event or whether it will trigger change in law provisions in a contract. As um, Dmitry said in previous presentation, uh, of course, uh, all of this um, analysis should be undertaken based on the particular contract and uh, governing law of the contract. However, um, uh, there are many common um, features of, of the contract and we'll talk about it later. Unscheduled business days, um, the effect how payment and delivery obligation have um, uh, have been changed. Um, additional requirements and guidance issued by um, government and local authorities, um, they definitely fall within definition of, um, of, um, of the laws in various countries. And definitely all such regulations need to be complied with, um, whether it's a matter of law or under some particular contract. Uh, increasing demand on advice on business risk profile and alternative strategies uh, in light of um, the new turbulent environment, including advice um, relevant to a particular sector of economy or industry, uh, including um, increasing uh, 
demand on uh, advice seeking for uh, in, in light of reputational and financial implications of business. Uh, uh, we are also uh, required to look at advice on structuring or even better to say restructuring of current uh, project which haven't been hasn't been, uh, haven't been launched yet or uh, which are scheduled to be launched uh, later this year. Since many uh, construction projects are being delivered using uh, and based on FIDIC standards form of contracts, um, and these forms of contracts are widely recognized and used, in April, International Mediation of Consulting Engineers, FIDIC, has issued COVID-19 guidance memorandum for users of FIDIC uh, standard forms of contract. In appreciation of extraordinary challenge, uh, which was uh, brought by COVID-19 outbreak, um, the main purpose stated in uh, this guidance memorandum by FIDIC um, is actually to help parties to consider solutions which could be mutually satisfactory and effective to both parties just to keep the construction project live and avoid disputes with a view to be fo focused on successful delivery of um, particular construction projects. In this memorandum, FIDIC uh, addresses uh, different likely scenarios which are in response to COVID-19 outbreak. One of the remedies and um, recipes for uh, both the companies uh, and con construction companies to consider is um, an extension of time for completion. Contractors, uh, which um, definitely suffered from difficulties in both attracting personnel uh, due to travel ban or quarantine requirements or other health and safety concern, they may request um, extension of time and um, pedic uh, based forms of contracts. There are, though, um, certain restrictions to be fully observed in order um, to be entitled to claim EOT. Namely, the event cause delay and shortage of personnel or goods must be unforeseeable. Well, I, I, I think that uh, COVID-19 outbreak is definitely fall within um, such category. The contractors must diligent, diligently follow the procedure laid down by government uh, authorities, which is um, also uh, could be a requirement of uh, the construction contract or any applicable law as well. These authorities delay or disrupt uh, the construction uh, the contractors' work, which um, is also um not uh, difficult to to meet uh, given the uh changes uh, in 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 the law that we are currently facing uh it is uh, very important to mention though um that extension of time as a remedy itself it it is not a financial remedy because um whether or not the contractor could um claim um some and financial compensation in addition to um, extension of time would uh, depend on um, actual circumstances and uh, whether or not the contractor can establish its entitlement um, using some other clauses of, uh, uh, of the contract or uh, uh, um, as a matter of law. Second, second big issue addressed in the guidance memorandum by FIDIC was a second uh, uh, remedy is a change uh, resulted from the change in law of the country. Change in law is um, one of the grounds that gives the contractor a right to request extension of time under the construction contract. Uh, but in addition to the extension of time, change in law also gives the right to claim a uh, change of the contract price um, and there are conditions uh, to the request and entitlement to change the contract price, which are currently, which are the following. 
a change in law happens uh, should, should happen after the commencement date so it is definitely applicable to project where works have commenced a change in law in, uh, of the country um, in a contract has uh, quite uh, in a contract which is based on FIDIC form I should say has a wide definition and various types of law both at state and local levels including various um, local and municipal laws including um, decrees or guidances um, and etc uh, as fatigue points out in um, in its um, guidance memorandum uh, emergency decrees and laws will likely fall within the broad definition of law provided in the FIDIC forms of contract. Um, important, though, is to know that um, the such law shall apply at location of the site uh, where permanent works are to be executed. Uh, third criteria is that the law must affect the contractor's performance of its obligation. Uh, another criteria is that the contractors must demonstrate that it suffers delay and or incur or will incur additional cost as a result of um, change in law, which is also not to demonstrate given the uh, amount of burdensome regulations um, which are currently in place, uh, at least in respect of the uh, health and safety requirements um, to the employees. Uh, the construction site, and etc. And the contractors must give notice to the employer engineer, uh, and this mainly will depend on the form of the contract. By the previous speaker, Dmitry, is the force majeure or exceptional event. Definition uh, and Excuse criteria me, for major event are uh, usually set out in the construction contract, um, including and, and those based on FIDIC uh, forms. Um, we we know though that COVID nineteen uh, may not necessarily be listed in, in the relevant clause, uh, um, including in, um, the listing of pandemic. Um, which is qualified uh, right now. Uh, however, usually the list of FM-like event is not full, is not comprehensive, and is usually opened. Um, so that said, the event, even if it is not listed in the clause of force majeure list of event, but it is subject to the criteria, it still may qualify as a force majeure exceptional event. Uh, when passing the relevant test. Um, so the test is the following. The event must be beyond the control of the parties and um, COVID-19 meets, meets this criteria. The party could not be reasonably um, provided uh, against before entering into the contract. And again, it should be true in respect of COVID-19. Having a rising, such party could not reasonably have avoided or overcome. Note the problem here, and FIDIC <coughs> brings our attention to potential argument to the set criteria. Namely, it recognizes that this part could be a problematic part uh, of the test, uh, as the one can argue that implementation of the relevant health and safety measures may make it possible to overcome the set uh, COVID-19 um, measures. At the same time, the counter argument could be that the government ban on construction activity in itself could not be avoided or overcome. Uh, the last criteria um, is that such event uh, is not substantially attributable to the other party, which uh, should be uh, more or less true in respect of COVID-19. So conclusion could be is that COVID-19 is likely to be treated as a FEM event, subject, however, to the provision of the contract and relevant local laws. Uh, 
once um, COVID-19 passed the test um, and it, it could be decided whether it qualifies as an FM event or exceptional event, uh, um, there will be a duty to notify the other party of such an event and a duty to mitigate. Usually, FM event typically results in a cessation of the impacted obligation and gives an extension of time only. Uh, and uh, usually, it also uh, accrues to termination time clock. In order to apply all of these measures, of course, the based on, on FIDIC construction forms um, as an impact to uh, COVID-19 outbreak. El, Ella, I apologize They may also for be scope for contractual you. hardship clauses Ella, Ella. to be invoked. Again, consider local law entitlement, as Dmitry previously uh, showed and demonstrated the examples. Um, Performance, liability time, and cost relief may be available to the contractual counterparty, but it again will mainly depend on the provisions of the contract itself. Um, response to COVID-19 itself or measures implemented uh, by reason of, of COVID-19 outbreak may lead to restriction of um, the restriction to on access, delay, or supply of equipment resources to be provided by the other parties. That may trigger variations um, uh, to um, contract provisions. Of course, it is all subject to terms of the contract. And um, all of these um, uh, measures may trigger entitlement to um, extension of time as well, or price adjustment or suspension or variation and, um, and even termination in some of the cases. So suspension and termination is another example of other claims uh, that could, uh, could be considered. Uh, and uh, all of these measures there uh, could be available both at law at, uh, and uh, be set out in the contract itself. Uh, FEDIC also mentioned in the guidance memorandum that it is important for the parties to be reminded that there is a specific dispute resolution mechanism, such as dispute adjudication boards, and in case um, there is a dispute, the party may refer their dispute to resolution of, of, of that board. Uh, and another obligation to be reminded to the parties is that, the, that all the parties shall timely comply with their communication obligations and mm, shall provide notices um, in timely and due manner and mm, should keep contemporary records. That uh, would help the parties um, to justify um, any of their claims in the future. Um, as, a, as a result, what we also see in the practice um, and what we can discuss with um, different clients is the way how to deal and how to resolve the situation uh, um, and how to keep the project um, to help both parties to uh, overcome the situation. Mainly, if um, uh, parties started a dialogue uh, they could first of all agree and acknowledge uh, that uh, COVID-19 outbreak has an impact on their relationship and they could clearly state it in any additional correspondence or exchange of um, any or a, a correspondence or um, amendment to their agreement. And they may also agree on a specific COVID-19 suspension period, specifically designed to address the situation. So during this COVID-19 suspension period, 
party, first of all, um, could be obliged to put all their measures as a uh, best efforts um, obligation to minimize possible consequences of such uh, COVID-19 suspension period. Uh, and then can even specify the obligations uh, which could be suspended. Um, as an example, it could be obligations to keep the personnel on the site, um, to deliver some goods, even some schedules um, of delivery of the goods can be affected and, and uh, reconsidered or rescheduled. So, and the parties may also consider which obligations are not affected and shall not be suspended. Uh, for example, um, all confidentiality obligations, IP obligations, um, and, and etc. cetera. Um, needless to say that since part, both parties suffering a lot from the situation um, with COVID-19 um, uh, outbreak, usually the suspension period which the party may agree upon um, uh, often goes together with some reasonable compensation of cost for that period. So it could be a combination of periodic payment uh, that the client um, the customer is go is um, required to pay to the contractor. Again, it depends mainly on the terms of the contract and uh, the arrangement. However, um, all of these costs uh, usually, uh, usually should shall be reasonable, and we rarely see that the client would agree to uh, compensate any profit or overhead. So it just really a cost um, that should be decided or agreed upon between the parties. And also some uh, remobilization amounts uh, just in order to re renew the works um, and bring it up to speed after, um, uh, after all of these measures will be released. So the next obligation to be considered to be included and negotiated at this stage is how to deal with demobilization and remobilization obligations. So, so it should be the contractor's um, obligation to un, uh, uh, demobilize or remobilize, um, again, subject to the terms and conditions agreed by the parties. And um, it was including upfront uh, an agreement on compensation of reasonable cost which uh, definitely needs uh, to be pre-agreed. Uh, notices regime uh, shall be a specific notices regime in respect of this COVID-19 suspension period and, uh, and notices um, uh, on demobilization and remobilization. Uh, so what we've seen so far is that the parties agree on a so-called like a long stop date for the suspension period and then they, uh, there might be an, even an option for additional suspension period or not. And then, um, again, there, there might be other remedies um, triggered by one of the parties. Uh, and these remedies are the termination. So the party needs carefully consider, uh, will, uh, will they trigger the termination? Uh, right and uh, as an option uh, if um, COVID-19 suspension period has lapsed for instance and, and or additional period that party may agree is also um, ended uh, however um, it is still not possible to resume the construction works so all of these con consequences of termination need to be negotiated in advance, uh, including the consequences of such termination, whether it will um, go uh, using the scenario of termination for convenience or the termination under different circumstances, uh, but it sh definitely should be decided by the parties before um, uh, and agreed. Other factors to consider and just to bear in mind is that uh, usually, um, since uh, many contracts with subcontractors are based on the back-to-back -back, uh, model to the main contract, so definitely it should be um, considered how to deal with a subcontractor's contract. Uh, basically, it should be in the same manner as it uh, would be agreed between the parties to the um, con 
a construction contract which is being negotiated between the customer and the contractor. And also uh, other factors to be taken into account is whether or not a consent of any third party involved in the project must be obtained, such as, for instance, uh, the consent of the financing organizations who provides financing and uh, and finance documents um, may require the lender's consent for any amendments to the construction contracts which party may uh, enter into and negotiate at this stage. So this is it. Thank you very much, Ella, for this great presentation on the impact. This is the end on construction uh, could you hear me do you hear me ella thank you very much thank you very much yes i, I can hear you now Shimin. thank you thank you thank you very much we seem to have experienced uh, some connection issues during your presentation but i would like to invite the audience to send their questions in the comment section and we will be answering them at the end of all the presentations Thank you very much, Ella. And I would like to now invite uh, Alex to discuss on how COVID-19 has impacted his daily uh, work. Thank you, Shirin. So, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us this uh, sunny Friday afternoon. Uh, when I was approached by the organizers of uh, this uh, seminar to, to elaborate a little bit on the changes, uh, how did uh, coronavirus and all this pandemic affected uh, our legal profession, day-to-day -day work, you know, I, I simply took a list of uh, paper and uh, prepared a list, uh, two columns of issues, uh, how we used to live, how we used to work and how we do it now and apparently will do within the next uh, months, I should say, and uh, at the end I had uh, four groups of issues and would be glad to share it with you. I do believe that you, to some extent, face uh, the, the same issues, the same problems, I should say. First group of issues, I call them uh, changes in day-to-day uh, -day work stream, day-to-day -day work. Uh, I should say that uh, during the last two or three months, my every day started with reading news in the legislation, the Russian legislation, uh, federal, global, uh, and news in the legislation of each uh, subject, each region of Russia, European, uh, US, uh, Asian regions. So all those regions where we, uh, our company, our group has interests or may have some interest. It was challenging, uh, really challenging, uh, tons of paper, hours of reading, lots of uh, groups in WhatsApp, uh, in uh, Zoom, in Facebook with my colleagues, uh, special for labor law, uh, lawyers, special for investment lawyers, in-house lawyers, and so on and so forth. More or less the same uh, issues, problems uh, we've been discussing and keep on discussing. What did the government man uh, mean by, by, by this or on this paper or next? Uh, what did they want it to achieve? What they actually achieve? What does it mean for us? What can we do? What we have to avoid? Really challenging, I can say. Uh, secondly, to reflect all this new stuff in the local papers, in the policies, in the rules, 24-7 uh, of calls and mails from my colleagues, from financial department, com commercial department, construction and so on. Alex, what does it mean? Can we do this? Can we travel there? What does it mean travel ban? Absolutely no travel, no business meetings, no business travels. Yes, guys, so far, nothing. <laughs> Borders are closed to some extent. Uh, and, uh, well, no personal meetings. What does it mean for us? Working in the family office, uh, you can imagine there are lots of uh, questions uh, that could be and should be addressed only in personal meetings. Uh, there is a question now. There is a question now because all our team was caught in uh, various uh, jurisdictions, cities, countries. Uh, we have to sort out these questions uh, to some extent, uh, to put on hold some questions. Uh, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. Uh, last but not least in this group, uh, new clothes. Literally new clothes. I had to put aside all my suits, uh, shirts, to buy a bit of a uh, sport outfit, to buy some new jeans, t-shirts, you know. Mm, 
I really love it, to be frank. <laughs> Another group of uh, issues uh, is relations with uh, consultants and contractors, I should say. I had to immediately look for new expertise in new jurisdictions, in all other jurisdictions. Uh, Europe, US, uh, Asia, Russia, um, specialists in uh, compliance, specialists in regulatory, in uh, tax, in customs regulations, banking regulations, all these spheres, all the areas uh, specified in each and every jurisdiction. Um, new time frames to be taken into consideration, new timing, uh, new working schedule of courts, of uh, the banks, of authorities, such uh, challenging stuff as, for, for instance, KYC procedure, which used to take months. Now it's duplicated two times at least, at least. New papers, new requirements, new documents. Um, please provide original or this and that and that document. But come on, guys, the borders are closed. Nevertheless, we have to, it's a new policy. For instance, in our Barclays Bank, please provide. Otherwise, the bank account is not open. Okay, I have to, to, to invite new ways to deliver the papers to you. Uh, new force majeure clause. It's the most interesting and challenging uh, part of negotiations with all the, all the, without any exceptions, with all the contractors. No one uh, wants to bear this liability. This is the first time we face, we used to write the work, word of, pandemia or something like that in the clauses before, but uh, it's the first time we face it and have to, to, to react proactively. I should say, not uh, retroactively, but rather proactively. Uh, also, someone has to pay for delays in our work, for delays in our construction works. No one wants to pay, the contractors do want to get uh, money for this delay. We do not want to pay for nothing, so it's a, it's a matter of negotiation. See, it's, it's really fantastic. And you know, if uh, some six months before I could have jumped uh, on a plane and sit down in the conference room with, with all the parties involved uh, and see 24, 30, 40 hours with coffee and pizza, but uh, to exit with a with, uh, well-drafted document, nowadays it's, uh, it's, it's hours of Zoom calls, conference calls, uh, emails, uh, Waste of time, I should say, but I expect the borders will be open soon. Uh, third group, uh, relations with uh, with colleagues. With colleagues, uh, with you, uh, the greatest concern so far is, again, uh, travel ban and uh, there is no possibility of personal meetings. I had to look for for, for local employees in this year in their jurisdiction to join our team part time somehow, uh, not only advisors but uh, in house lawyers to, to 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 address very delicate issues uh, to take care of all these hours of Skype and Zoom calls, literally hours. I, I sometimes even forget whether my camera is on or off. Or my earphones are always on, you know, on ACDC, so well, it's, it's really challenging. Uh, and fourth group, I would say, not even a comment, but rather a forest. What we all hear is new reality, and we have to put up with it, because it's not a matter of uh, weeks, months. I, I, I would say for at least next 12 months, we have to restructure, readdress our uh, way of working. Uh, I can judge based on my colleagues and friends working in huge corporations such as Yandex, Pepsi, for instance. They're cutting their expenses, uh, they're cutting employees, they're um, uh, cutting lease expenses. They realize that the business can work uh, quite productive uh, without going to the office uh, five business days per week. They are changing the, the, the schedule and the, the employees will be going to the office uh, three four days per week, not more. They can operate remotely. It's a great cut of expenses and they do realize this. Uh, some of them uh, take uh, the pandemic as a good uh, background for cutting uh, expenses on employees. Good excuse. I should say a good excuse. Uh, less business trips, as far as I can judge, even when the borders are opened, uh, some of my colleagues, for instance, literally afraid of traveling to Asia, for instance, uh, to Hong Kong. Uh, it's unpredictable how it works to the States, also business there, but no one knows how it works. New visa problems and so on and so forth. 
Uh, so we seriously thinking about relocation of certain employees of various departments, financial, commercial, legal, and so on, to, 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 to increase the substance in the jurisdiction where we have business interests. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, new work-life balance. We have to we have to find time for our families. We have to find time to 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 sleep. We have to find time to do some sport. It's it's really important. And otherwise, we simply go go mad. So good luck to all of us in this new reality. It's it's really challenging, and I personally enjoy it. That's it. Thank you very much, Alexander. It's uh, great to know that lawyers were able to quickly adapt to the new reality, to the new reality, to this new normal. Thank you very much for these insights. And I would like to now invite uh, Thomas Vail to reflect on the previous presentations. Thomas, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak uh, to reiterate the introduction that came nearly an hour ago, I'm Thomas Vail. Uh, I'm the founder of Vail Dispute Resolution. It's a boutique uh, disputes practice focused on arbitration in the Russia CIS part of the world uh, because I'm a native Russian speaker. Um, I'd like to thank all of my co-panelists for their excellent presentations. Uh, it's It's been a pleasure to, to hear the different aspects of your practice and how they've been impacted by COVID and particularly focusing on the contractual side of things. So I have the benefit of speaking last, and uh, that gives me the opportunity to touch on certain issues that have been raised and also to add some of my, my own observations um, with the benefit perhaps of uh, the English law perspective and a little bit of the US or New York law perspective as I'm qualified in both jurisdictions. Um, there have been a lot of materials and literature uh, put out on this subject uh, as a result of COVID, and uh, and so there's a lot of material to synthesize. So I'll try to do that uh, in the next, say, ten minutes, because I, I know that we're we're running short on time. Uh, so first, I'll I'll make a few observations about English law. I'll tie that into some other comments that have been raised, and then I'll conclude with some thoughts about the future. So, as, as some of us may know, but perhaps uh, others are less familiar with the ins and outs of English law in particular. Uh, English law prides itself on taking a commercial law, a commercial approach to disputes and uh, honoring the wishes of the parties as embodied in their contract. So from a policy perspective, this means that uh, commentators, for example, Bickle, uh, the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, which has published some very useful materials on this that I'll be drawing from, they focused on avoiding an economic depression caused by the pandemic. And, and we heard some comments from Dimitri, which were uh, echoing this this principle. Um, and in particular, we, we probably want to focus on the discussion of supply chains. Uh, as supply chains are increasingly increasing global, the disruption of one contract can disrupt an entire chain. Uh, and therefore, one dispute can lead to an entire chain of disputes. Um, so, and I think we heard some comments from Alexander in this vein as well. At the same time, as we have these pandemic-related disputes, we have other disputes arising uh, as as though, can, can you hear me still? As though, um, as though they're caused by the pandemic, when in fact the pandemic might be a cover for other issues that have been going on already in the background. So parties have to be very uh, astute in determining whether there's really a pandemic issue going on or if it's actually something else. Um, so the kinds of disputes that we're talking about, we've heard already uh, about hardship, uh, force majeure. Uh, what we haven't heard so much about is frustration, unjust enrichment, and material adverse change. And I might touch on some of those principles a little bit in, in my comments. Um, so. These principles, they're well established both in the common and civil law systems, but we've not seen quite this kind of situation before. Uh, some common issues, that is some parallel issues in the past that might arise that are similar to this might be the SARS pandemic in 2006 and the economic downturn financial crisis in 2007 and eight. And, and so some of the examples that I'll be touching on 
uh, relate to those issues. Uh, and in fact, uh, while I'm discussing the economic downturn, I saw an, an interesting slide in Dimitri's presentation talking about how economic downturn uh, is not equivalent to force majeure. Um, and I, I think that's probably generally uh, supported under arbitral practice. I, I would point to an interesting example that I came across uh, under New York law, which are two cases that relate to the 2008 financial crisis. Um, so there were two cases in 2011, uh, which were in the US courts uh, under contracts governed by New York law. One was uh, the Avalon case versus Wachovia Bank, uh, where the economic downturn there was not considered to be a force majeure event. But there was a second case in 2011 where the clause in the contract specifically used the phrase, quote, change to economic conditions, unquote, as a force majeure event. And that was found to trigger uh, the force majeure clause. So, so we have it, everything, as, as you noted and as others have noted, is very much dependent on the contractual language. Um, so we may find that economic downturns are indeed covered by force majeure clauses if the clause has been drafted in that particular way. Um, I'll note that force majeure um, and good faith, for that matter, these are not concepts that are uh, included in English law as part of the, uh, as terms of art, uh, they might be included in contracts and therefore English law will recognize the contract and the provision that reflects that, but they're not reflected on their own in the common law, as opposed to say the principle of frustration, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, so, and Alexander touched upon the fact that there are new force majeure clauses being drafted at the moment, of course, in, in relation to this. So uh, the language of those clauses needs to be very carefully considered. Uh, that's that's not new information, but it's worth emphasizing that every, every word, every phrase uh, can drastically change the outcome of, of who has to bear the costs for any particular event. So those need to be reviewed specifically. Um, under English law, force majeure clauses are construed restrictively, meaning that any ambiguity will be resolved against the party seeking to rely on the clause. So that further underscores the importance of drafting things very carefully and clearly. Um, so I've touched on those New York case law examples. Um, another kind of clause that could be included in contract is a hardship clause. Um, and we heard a little bit from Dimitri on that. Uh, but specifically under English law, uh, English law, of course, recognizes that. Um, and that kind of clause will provide that in certain circumstances, parties will renegotiate, for example, the price. Um, or they might include a provision that a third party can intervene if the parties fail to reach agreement on such renegotiation. And in my concluding remarks, we'll, we'll touch on kind of alternative dispute resolution methods which are short of a full-blown arbitration or court litigation, which might allow parties to move forward without um, too much pain. So moving on to frustration, uh, and I'll be touching on a point that Ella raised in her presentation as well. Uh, in contrast to force majeure, frustration is recognized as a common law principle, uh, and it serves to discharge parties from their obligations, um, where, for example, the circumstances have changed so dramatically that performance of the contract is radically different to that which the parties had in mind and agreed. Uh, and that's a long-standing uh, test under English law, um, where most recently uh, in the Sea Angel case in 2007, uh, not most recently, but that's the most recent case where this was kind of determined to be the, the, the key case for, for setting out the test is um, whether the courts will look at the extent to which the risk for a certain event has been impliedly allocated between the parties. And we've heard from some of the previous presentations about this risk allocation principle, very important. Um, so both parties will be released, but uh, importantly, that does not render the contract void ab initio. And that's an important point to keep in mind. Um, and that's of course a drastic result that both parties will be released. And on that basis, the English courts have taken the position that it's not to be lightly invoked uh, and courts are going to be looking very carefully. It's a high threshold to meet uh, to allow the parties to be released from their uh, 
obligations. Um, I'll note also that under English law, uh, there's legislation that allows the court to make adjustments to the party's positions. This is under the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act of 1943. So this is similarly a way for a third party to intervene and, and modify the contract. And, and I think a thread that we'll hear throughout this pandemic and throughout my comments here is that parties might be able to find or will encounter uh, different flexible approaches, more flexible approaches than they might in another situation to try to resolve their conflicts. Um, so coming to uh, one of the points raised by Ella in terms of emergencies uh, notified by governments, I, I came across an interesting example where uh, in Spain, uh, there were government recommendations made uh, where parties relied on the force majeure provision in relation to the to a contract during the SARS outbreak in 2006. So in Spain, there was a decision in relation to travel to Toronto, where the Spanish court uh, issued guidance discouraging travel to Toronto during the SARS outbreak. And someone, a party made a claim for a refund to a flight, um, which was upheld, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the flight was not canceled with the rationale being that someone with average diligence would heed the recommendations of the authorities and not endanger health by recklessly traveling to a place subject to such a health alert. So that's an interesting example, of course, on the much more personal and individual level, but I imagine that that principle could be extended at least under Spanish law or perhaps under other civil law systems to extend more widely. Um, I won't spend any time on unjust enrichment. Uh, people or parties under English law tend to focus on the frustration argument. And then there's also the issue of material adverse change, um, which more commonly arises in finance documents and M&A documents. Uh, which allows parties to declare an event of default or exit from a transaction where there's been a fundamental change in a party's ability, ability to perform its obligations. Um, so these kinds of contracts are relatively rarely interpreted by courts, um, but in light of the pandemic, we may see more of these clauses being interpreted as the parties might seek to go to litigation or to arbitration. Um, so we might see that, uh, for example, the pandemic has raised economic issues for one business, uh, which are not clear to its counterparty. Um, in, for example, its company accounts are at the end of a term of a loan. And uh, I think these kinds of issues will arise more commonly. Uh, and the ability of parties to rely on those clauses will turn on the specific language again, as we've mentioned before with relation to force majeure. Um, English courts have held in the context of a loan agreement that a change in financial condition would only be considered uh, material if it significantly affects a borrower's ability to perform its obligations for a long time. And the change is not a circumstance of which the lender was aware at the time of the agreement. And there's a similar approach in US case law, which describes such clauses in M&A context as um, a backstop protecting the acquirer from the occurrence of unknown events that substantially threatened the overall earnings potential of the target in a durationally significant manner. So that's a, a very brief overview uh, of the English law position and tying it to some of the comments that we've heard uh, from the other presentations. I'll briefly, in the next couple of minutes, and I'm still trying to stay very brief, uh, some, some observations about the future. Um, so it's notable that the UK has issued guidance on responsible contractual behavior uh, in the context of the pandemic, and it's urging parties to be responsible and fair in relation to, say, impaired performance, extensions of time, claims of force majeure, frustration, change of law, and other claims. But that guidance is not legislation, and it does not override existing law or contracts. Um, I'll also note that in commercial disputes, regardless of the pandemic, English procedure encourages parties to engage in mediation, uh, and there are cost implications for the parties if they don't engage in mediation before bringing their dispute to the courts. Um, some jurisdictions have gone further than this. Uh, for example, France, Germany, and Singapore have adopted measures um, which we might refer to as breathing space. And in fact, the Bickel materials refer to that as breathing space. It's a helpful 
framework for, for thinking about these issues, uh, which offers temporary relief to specified businesses and individuals which are unable to fulfill their contractual obligations because of COVID. Um, for example, in Singapore, the legislation refers to parties instead of bringing their cases to court, uh, allow independent assessors to issue binding determinations on the basis of the financial condition of a party and trying to achieve an outcome that is just and equitable. So we see something which is not quite a full-blown dispute, but tries to allow parties to take their uh, businesses and economic relationships further uh, despite the pandemic. Um, so to, to conclude, uh, it's, it's worth considering carefully if it makes sense for parties to uh, go to a full-blown dispute, whether it's litigation or arbitration, or if it makes sense to find a middle way, which is to allow some breathing room, such as a negotiation or a mediation. And there are structures in place to allow those kinds of discussions to take place effectively. Um, courts are still operating virtually, uh, touching on a comment from Alexander, um, and arbitrations are even more uh, active in that respect, uh, being able to adapt more flexibly their procedures to the current pandemic. Um, and of course, the party's consideration on how to best proceed will be driven by whether the underlying issues are actually pandemic related or they recover for something else. So I'll conclude my remarks there and uh, I want to thank uh, my co-panelists for their illuminating presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this interesting presentation and elaborating on alternative methods of dispute resolution. Um, now our session comes to its end. This, this webinar has been organized by Putilin Sipel and American University of Central Asia. I would like to thank all of, all of our speakers for their insightful, enlightening, and very interesting presentation and stimulating discussions. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you uh, in person one day after this pandemic is over. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.